I start with introducing the the title of my speech. Um, I used this title for a long time because um, uh, I'm personally Nietzsche is one of my fame, like my most important thinkers, and he has a really strong uh, critics about Western civilization. Uh, and culture, therefore, his methods of analyzing the culture in West always very useful for me to look at uh, our own culture. So this title comes from one of his early books. Actually, this was his dissertation. The original title is The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music. So I change it to Birth of Typography Out of the Spirit of Calligraphy. Um, but the point is, this is my wish. I don't think it's it's happening at the moment. So uh, all of us, I think, we're trying to get to this point, but still, we need to, we need to work. So uh, before uh, getting to the part that's directly related to uh, calligraphy and typography, I would like to talk about s some of my criteria about things I'm going to talk about in the following. Um, these are my understanding about culture, art, and some of them are strongly, I believe, on them, which might be sounds mm, not really uh, open, but <clears throat> I think it would help you to understand uh, why I'm criticizing uh, things about calligraphy sometimes. So let's start with, with, with origin, the word. So uh, I've been researching on uh, the way we're criticizing especially art around us. And I find out usually we're using this kind of words loosely, more or less, mm, then I realize we need to be more precise about what, we, what we're talking about. So if you look at the simple definition of origin, uh, as you can see in the first one, it talks about the, uh, the point or the place where something begins or arise or drive. But in synonyms, the fourth one, it says Genesis, as you can see, which is very... Uh, close to what we call it, uh, what we, um, we can uh, call it uh, creation. This is bibliotic uh, word uh, and relates to creation somehow. So therefore, it means when something is original, it should be creative or other way around. So we cannot really have anything creative and not being original or, um, as I said, other way around. So here also it's very, so we are familiar with this, I know, but what is interesting for me is the last, last definition. I, I'm not sure you can see it, but it says uh, from out of nothing. This is the simple meaning of creation. So it means if there is any sign or any uh, uh, similarity between what, what we create with something else that exists before us, we are not creating anything. We're just imitating existing stuff with a different variation. Um, simple uh, definition of graphic design for me is a combination of art plus technology, which is uh, Photography and cinema also, they are the same category with graphic design because these are the, the kind of art they appeared after the Industrial Revolution in Europe. And all of them, they use technology and visual art as what we know today. So by this, I mean, still I'm thinking of graphic design as an art, not necessarily kind of, uh, let's say, the definitions that everyone familiar with so far. And it's written in lots of books. Um, for example, one of the worst one is uh, graphic design is problem solving. So 
Uh, I'm not against it. That's what we're doing usually, but um, I think graphic design could be more than that. Uh, also, from another perspective, graphic design simply means type plus image, and this type nowadays could be everything. Could be could be writing, could be hand lettering, or existing uh, calligraphy. You can scan it, use it. So these are all in the same category. So, uh, sorry, these are, they're not supposed to be like that, but it's okay. So next things I would like to talk about is actually, I don't believe on uh, globalization, because um, I'll, I'll explain later, but before that, I would like to uh, just test something with you. It's a simple um, test. Let's just listen to what, can you hear? Can you hear? So, do you know what is this? Yeah, I just ruined it, sorry. So, how many of you, you I, I can't see you, but how many of you, you know what is this music? But even if you don't know exactly what it is, you, you've heard before, right? Here and there. So, this is the, this is the full information about the, this piece. So, it's a Bach, air, and... I'm sorry? I said, is it clear you have people that heard the Albino? No. No, no, no. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, um, this is from, uh, from Bach, uh, who lives between 6058 to 1750, Germany, Baroque period. And now please listen to the second part. Anyone knows this music? No, who is it? Not sitar. It's too too general. <laughs> no, this is my Persian friend, I think. <laughs> no, by the way, this is Said Hormozi. <laughs> yeah, okay. This is Said Hormozi Mahur from 1897 to 1976. Iran, he's playing sitar, and he's playing kind of radif um, skills. But uh, my point was, you know, the first one, the first piece of music, it's very familiar to all of us, including me. And the second one is just something that most of you, maybe, most of you, uh, you heard for first time. So uh, what I'm trying to say is actually we are... Uh, we are getting information very, very uh, by selection. So everything we know about art around us is completely selected and we are not completely free to get what we want to uh, know about music, for example, in, the, in that case. Um, so we know a lot about Baroque music, much more than what we know about, for example, Mahur, which is very close to us here as a Lebanese compared to someone in, in, in Germany, for example, in Baroque period. Another example actually is this one. Do you know this logo? Can you, can you talk? I can't see you, sorry. Yeah, so what is it? Yeah, this is written, no, what is for? <laughs> exactly, okay. And this is the information about this logo designed by Paul Round. 1940 to 1996. And do you know anything about this one? Have you seen it before? 
Yeah, this is designed by Mortaza Mayez, Iranian graphic designers, 1935, 2005. It's a logo for museum, Reza Abbas Museum in Tehran. <clears throat> Again, the point is, I really tried hard to understand why this logo is much better than the second one. Or why is that famous? The answer simply means IBM is really famous, not the logo. And the logo is not even very good logo. I mean, this is like sacrilege what I'm saying because Paul Rand is like keystone of graphic design, but compared to, to this one, at least I think this logo deserved to be known as the first one. If we go just visually without adding information, extra information to it. Uh, so therefore, globalization simply for me means everything that we understand according to the others. It's not our own information. It's like uh, whatever, we, what, simply actually globalization means Let's talk about the common language, and by chance, this language is the language that we speak. This is not just verbal language. I'm not talking about that. It's everything. It's about music. It's about uh, visual art. It's about even culture. So basically, this is globalization. These are kind of statics that we every day we deal with and we learn how to read them, how to deal with them, visually I'm speaking. Um, and uh, we're surrounded by those images all the time. We have also, oh God, this is very, very bad, I'm sorry. It's, it's funny enough, this is about typography. <laughs> I swear to God, this was, I, I fixed them all last night. I don't know what's happened. Maybe, maybe you can help me. I think we should change the screen size. That's the problem. I'm sorry, it would take... No, I need to do it, I think. Anyway, I'm, I, I try to continue. So universal also, the, the word that we're using it a lot for different stuff. For example, we say universal language, but again, if we just keep uh, looking at what's happening around us, it's like we're talking the, in language, we're talking to each other in English, all of us. You are Lebanese, your language is Arabic, mine is Persian, but we speak to each other in English because this is the Universal language kind of doesn't work. Okay, thanks. Can you help? Yeah, I think you need to change this. Thank you, as always. <laughs> yes. That's your thing. It's not from the Nexus. No? It's from... It's not... No, it's from this. From what? The microphone? Yes, come. No, you can't. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's not from... Okay, sorry. Thanks. Next. No. <laughs> Second attempt. No, I didn't. Thank you, Pajan. You meant it on the avant-garde. Sorry? You meant it on purpose and it's avant-garde. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. Oh, this is supposed to mean international. Come on. This is so funny. Anyway, I prefer I prefer the word international at least if you want to talk about ex cultural exchange, I prefer international, because at least in international we have nation, which refers to the spe specific group of people that they live under the specific culture. For example, this is, this is a painting from Hokusai, uh, 1829, 
this is to me international painting or visual language, which is uh, clearly uh, shows what it is. You can read it completely without any additional information. But at the same time, it's absolutely Japanese. So there is nothing uh, wrong about this. You don't need to reduce or uh, forget your own culture to speak to the others. And also, uh, we have in North Europe, in Sweden, in Swiss, we had this style, which we call it Swiss style. Later on, they called it uh, international style. Um, they they attempt to do the same things, but of course it's based on their own uh, understanding of images and type and forms and shapes. But I can I can accept that because also they try to speak to everyone with a minimum of uh, uh, changing the other cultures as much as possible. So this is an example of to 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 say actually how uh, sim simple shapes can can take uh, to the different level and uh, carries the culture somehow. So basically, circle you can't really say for example circle can be Japanese or Swiss, but see how it works. This is Japanese circles. Tadano uh, Yoko. This is Swiss circle. Joseph Muller Brockman. This is Russian Elitsitsky. And this is me. Just so you see, I think it's very interesting to see how you can keep your uh, identity and play with even very, very simple and basic shapes and forms, which is nowadays is not really an issue anymore. So no one really think about it. So this is supposed to be education. <laughs> uh, so now I need to go to the second part. Uh, I want to talk about the education in relation to what I said in the beginning. So I studied in an art school in Iran same as all other schools almost everywhere. And uh, the program was based on what was very known back then in Bauhaus. So the whole program was based on that in the beginning. And then after a few years, they changed it to, uh, to Bozar in Paris. So for a few years was combination of these two together. But this, is, this by itself is not a problem, but the problem was they were forcing us uh, to to see what to to see what we're learning in the class on Persian art. So, for example, I remember we had uh, we had exercises to go and find some images like that and try to find the rhythm on them or find the uh, harmony in color based on Johann's Eaton. So, of course, back then I didn't have any idea about what I'm doing, but the problem is uh, when you start thinking like that and you start understanding visual world like that, then later on it's very hard to put it aside. Still today, uh, I can't do that easily. I, re I really need to go over lots of different researchers to uh, to put aside all of those information, pre-information that is planned, planted in my mind, to be able to see my own culture or art, such as this one. I remember, for example, we did also exercise on that to find a rhythm on lines on the calligraphy, piece of calligraphy like that, which is absolutely wrong to me. Or this is another example. I think some of you, you might remember this kind of spiral. Uh, they used to put it in every single miniature pa Persian painting, and they would claim there is a magical relationship between uh, elements in miniature. And 15 years after, somebody else came and says, these are all nonsense. There is, and I did exam on that. Um, So uh, these are like some of the things that we used to learn at school, like these are 
our heroes like Robert Rauschenberg or uh, Andy Warhol. Uh, so this is my grandfather, he was calligrapher, not really professional, just as a hobby. But uh, while I was a student, uh, we used to have conversation a lot with each other about art because he was really interested about art. He was completely uh, illiterate according to art. It was just a hobby for him. Uh, but he was like, he had a good talent in many things like playing tar or um, writing good. And he was a really good tailor as well. Uh, once we had a conversation in my studio, this is me. And by the way, I've been born with beard. Uh, once we had a conversation, he came to my, my, my studio. I had two posters in the wall, which is this one from Rauschenberg and Jackson Pollock. And then he asked me about what are those? What are this in the wall? Uh, so simply if someone else would ask you this question, it's easy to say these are painting, but I knew when he's asking this question, I'm in a trouble, I need to explain exactly what, what are they. Um, so I, I took the challenge, I tried to explain like good half an hour, I give him a lecture about what are they. And of course he wasn't convinced completely, but then I asked him, what do you think about them? He said something that really makes me think about what I'm doing. He said, uh, you have lots of information about these paintings, that's why you like them. I have zero information. To me, they are just mm, paints on canvas. And he meant actually wasting, somebody wasted those painted, paints on canvas. So, um, of course, this is, sounds really like uncivilized and weird, but um, actually makes me think about that. If you want to do something about your own culture, you need to try to forget what you learned before, because otherwise there is no way to get away from it. Always those information would come back and uh, somehow you mix them up together. Uh, this goes to everything, including, of course, our knowledge about calligraphy and typography. Uh, this is very, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you know what is this. This is the, the letters that we know today. How we, how we design them for any kind of phones or but that's not the point. My point is when you want to, nowadays people, children in school, also they learn letters like that. And actually I checked with my grandparents that how they would learn, they used to learn uh, alphabet. They had no idea about why we're doing that. For them, there was just one meme or one bear in a different position that would change form, that's all. But seeing them like this for them was very strange. Uh, so this is not, we're not talking about typography at all. I, this is just, because this is happening in Iran, I don't know about here, but I'm guessing it's the same, same system more or less. Same? Yeah. So yeah, uh, clearly teachers at class, they say we have four different kind of bear, this comes in the beginning, this goes in the middle, I don't know what, so we know all of the story, but uh, this by itself in the first year of school doesn't make sense at all because none of those children, they want to design a type. They just want to learn how to read. No, these are all bear. Yes. By the way, would would you please wait till the end, and we can discuss about. Sorry. Um, this is how uh, they used to learn connections and different position of the letters. So, which is 
for us it's not a, not a case anymore because it's too complicated it needs a lots of efforts and doesn't really match with technology we're using now therefore we put it aside we're trying to fix the new technology and these are what we get now we talk about typography because this is it all of us we know what's happening even with the digital i i know i know that they trying to solve this problem but still solving this problem still is an issue for me i don't know why we need to solve that problem instead of thinking about something completely different than based on our writing system instead of just solving problems that comes from somewhere else and it's not really it's about it, about us so also i need to because it was in the announcement that i'm going to talk about perso arabic the point is uh of course this writings known as arabic writing there's no doubt about that but uh in iran i, I used to call it persian writing system it was really obvious no one in iran says arabic and since i moved here i started using arabic uh this is not made up word exist in linguistics also in uh, uh writing researches people they use that word so this means uh some of the researchers they 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 really uh believe that the contribution of iranians on uh arabic writing system it's words to mentioned in the name of the writing system so uh khat or a script or writings without any categorization has two function for me uh number one is recording thoughts information emotions uh and other stuff the second things is uh manifestation of beauty from many many old time we can we can we can find that it's not just about the calligraphy we know today even uh from conio forms you can see the trial of people to uh to make the writings as beautiful as possible by adding decorations forms and shapes to it so uh calligraphy <coughs> simply means comes from two words kali and graphy we know graphy means uh, drawing or writing in general in latin but kali it's interesting it comes from kalos and means beauty and while we talking whenever i say calligraphy i mean i mean uh, arabic persian arabic calligraphy i'm not talking about the chinese or other version of calligraphy uh, we have the same word in persian which is khushnavisi it's exactly it has same meaning khush means good nice and nevisi means right uh, writing and we have combination of this word uh, for other stuff so khush surat means beautiful person khush ahang means someone who has a good voice uh we have lots of books and information about um um about calligraphy but uh unfortunately we don't have much things about typography because obviously we don't we didn't have uh typography uh for example this is a two page of one of the old books about uh calligraphy that it talks about different step stage of uh how to become a good calligrapher in this part actually we have 12 stage and these are the translation of this 12 stage what is important I mean we don't have time to go over all of them but what is really interesting at from number 1 till 10 is practical stuff we're talking about like curves form shapes thickness uh balance but then number 11 and 12 is about purity and dignity and this is by itself i think it should it talks about things that we don't really think about it anymore so we think if technically we know how to do it or if you just know the shapes and form that's enough about enough for what we're doing ah uh, this is uh yeah this is also one of my beliefs unfortunately and i'm sorry for that 
but uh, to me calligraphy is dead because uh, based on what I said about origin and creativity, I don't believe uh, we're doing anything creative in calligraphy. These are um, one of most of the things that are happening now under the name of calligraphy is just a different variation. They are all beautiful. They are all good, but uh, there is no evolution in calligraphy anymore from that date. I'm referring to that based on Iranian calligraphy, but I'm sure we can find a similar uh, position and situation about, uh, about other countries. So this person is the last person we consider him as a creative calligrapher in Iran. He's very famous, Mirza Ghulam Mirza Isfani. And this, this is his image. And this, these are some of the examples of his works. These are called Siyah Mashq, it's a practice of uh, Nastaliq. And usually they, they would do that to learn mostly because this, this person is a master of calligraphy, doesn't need to practice. Uh, but mostly they would say, we do, we're doing this because we want to understand the spirit of calligraphy. Some more examples. So just to tell you uh, why I'm saying calligraphy is dead, we have uh, Iranian Calligraphy Association in Iran, and they have this different ranking. Uh, so when you start, you are a beginner. It takes you at least three years to, be, to become mediocre, and then two, three years to be good, and then excellent. Uh, at least two, three years to be distinguished. And last one is so good, so interesting, it's super premium. I don't know what it means even. Uh, but then between that and being a master, also we have like five years. And this five years you need to work with one of other masters to become a master. And they have 220 branch, uh, 750 masters. Just remember what I said about how you became master. And 5,000 excellent and 60,000 members. This by itself is very good news. Of course, I'm happy. At least they're keeping it alive. But out of all of those, when you search uh, Iranian uh, Calligraphy Association, that's what you get in internet. This is today, and if you search the name of the person I told you, you get that one, with the hundred years in between. So this and that. By the way, this is, this is by one person, and this is by 60,000 members. <clears throat> so we go to typography. Uh, as we know, typography is a combination of typo and graphy. So graphy is clear what it means, but typo again, it's good to go over it. Because today, we many people, especially students, they, they don't know typo doesn't refer to writing at all. There's nothing to do with writings. This is the first and correct meaning of typo. typo. Type means a category of people or things having common char characteristics. This is the fake, the third one is a fake meaning that they give it to typo because we're talking about the movable letters. There's nothing to do with writing, basically. And in this combination, as you can see, there is nothing to do with the beauty. So from here, we're losing beauty. is not a part, big part of it at all. It's based on your taste as a designer, of course, but it's not, it's not in it. Uh, so graphy comes from graph and it means uh, written or drawn in a specified way. So typography could be very simple as such as these examples from setting good font for the books to very avant-garde like this piece from Rush, from Germany uh, or, or, or this one which is very recent, 2015, you can see the date. Um, 
So these are all considered as a typography nowadays. And even can go further, you can do uh, handwriting, you can use other elements and make shapes, uh, uh, make uh, letters out of uh, images, form shapes. They're all considered as typography. What is important in the history of graphic design in the West, parallel to history of graphic design, we have history of typography. So it starts with really old designers such as Eric Gill, for example. As you can see, he was a very good illustrator and also he designed the, the letters just next to it, which is very well rare in our history of graphic design because mostly designers in, in my country and here also I think it's similar, they come from painting. So they usually illustrate things without really thinking about typography much, uh, or at least in this level. This is another example from <coughs> Lucien Bernhard. Uh, he designed a poster and same time he designed, he considered as one of the best actually type designers in the world. And this is one of his, his phones. So this is the things that actually we lacking seriously about our typography. Uh, and it's not about sitting and trying to just produce more type. <clears throat> we need to really think about how we can solve all of those problems and this gap somehow. Um, there is something else about uh, legibility because this is one of the values of type which comes directly from, from the West and under Western understanding of typography, uh, which is um, legibility of the letters we're designing together. But what we don't know is actually this legibility usually is based on newspapers, books, and TV. So when, whenever we say something is legible, we're comparing it with, with newspapers mostly. Uh, otherwise, it's not legible, which is not the case. If you go back to history, just 100 years ago, less even, there are books written by hand, and people still, they're using it today. They can read it because they're not really uh, used to read newspaper that, that much. Such as this, for example. I'm not inviting anyone to have a newspaper like that nowadays, but I'm imagining if we would continue different process, we would get somewhere else than making newspaper look like New York Times just with the Pers like Persian or Arabic letters in it. Uh, these are good examples of dealing with technology 100 years ago or less a bit. Uh, so they, they're using technology, which is lithograph back then, but they try to keep their own statics as much as possible. This is very obvious. As, as soon as you look at them, you can say these are not Western at all, but they're using technology. That's, that's the things that we're not doing it today. This is another example. This is a book I told you actually. This is a textbook of people if they want to study theology. These are this is one of their books, so they read it every day and it's very legible. It's okay. There's no problem. So, as we all know, actually, things start with this man, Gutenberg. He designed these letters for his machine, and we need, to, we need to realize when he was designing that, he didn't really think about us at all. So he was just solving his own problem to find a way to, pub, to publish book in an easy way and faster and cheaper, of course. So after a while, uh, this technology came for many reasons, of course, political, related, related to power, of course, money, and many, many other stuff. Uh, we start importing this technology to our countries. Uh, and then that's what happened. We used to, uh, I'm sure you can, you can compare these two together. Maybe you can't really read it, but these are same sentence. So this is the reduction I'm talking about, about uh, calligraphy to type. And we are all okay with that so far. I mean, no one complains much, but 
what we're doing actually we're looking at the at the calligraphy as a piece of semi art that we can have a good time with it just put it in a wall and then second one is the one we need to use it we need to work with it <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> these are the very early arabic type designed for um, printing books and you can see actually this is a really very interesting uh, example to see even the designers when of course, when it was from the Western side, they were not really caring about how they design letters. So Sheen would have like four different teeth, I don't know what, so details, and suddenly some of them, they have serifs, some not, so. But this is another example, more or less same time, designed by, I'm not sure, I'm, I, I'm not sure that the design is Iranian, but this book published in Iran, and you can see this is a printed book with a movable type, but you can see how close is how close is this text to calligraphy, because they were not really trying to like uh, making something different as what they used to have, without thinking about this is a technology we need to change everything. There is a huge resistance from. Uh, calligraphers to not even use this movable type because in Iran, for example, after a while using this type, they went back to lithography because they were not really convinced by the shape of the letters. So in the history, there is something uh, strange happened in Iran. So when movable type came to Iran, they stopped lithography because it was much easier, of course. But after a while, you will see there are lots of books, again, published, printed by uh, by lithography, such as this one. Even for that, this is a very interesting example. This is a lithographic book about the famous uh, epic stories, Shahnameh in Iran. Uh, you, if you look at the type closely, uh, because lithography is not really precise, you cannot have very sharp edges. So therefore, uh, they try to redesign a new uh, Nastali that doesn't have a zero point. So the end of all letters, Re, Vav, uh, they don't go to the completely zero from let's say five, six. So therefore they try to adapt somehow with the technology by, by changing uh, the calligraphy. Uh, then we move to graphic design, fine art, and applied art, then how we use the typography and calligraphy on them. So I'm not going to touch, talk much about art, fine art and applied art, just some examples. This is some, this is examples from uh, 40 years ago, Iran, uh, poster for film. This is more recent, uh, from young generation Iran, six years ago. These are some examples of uh, painters in Iran. They started using almost 50, 60 years ago, using uh, calligraphy in their uh, paintings. It's become very, very uh, trendy. Even back then, I'm not talking about now, because we all know what's going on. Uh, this is from Ahmad Esai. He's very good calligrapher also is a good painter so always he combined these two together and makes beautiful stuff this is another work of him uh, and recently Shirin Neshat for example she's using uh, handwriting slash calligraphy kind of in her work and also in applied art, still people in Iran, they try to do things that relates to our visual tradition. These are ceramics very recently uh, someone did or in carpets, they try to use it. But I would like to talk about graphic design. In before evolution, we had, in general, we have really good history of graphic design in Iran. Uh, because we started many, many years ago, almost like 50 something, five years ago, uh, start university, in the university we had this program. Um, so therefore graphic design starts very early in Iran. <clears throat> but as you can see in this example, this is from 1975, it's a beautiful poster, very, very interesting illustrations. But when it comes to type, 
it's completely disaster. So uh, you can see that the designer who is amazingly good at making images, when it comes to typography, he just uh, selects some of the letters and this, is, this was very common back then, of course. Uh, and he wrote a uh, Persian title for the poster. These are different approaches from different designers to how to deal with the, with the English and Persian uh, type in their posters. This is another example. This happens a lot. So they, they didn't know what to do with the typography. Therefore, very simple solution. Just put them top or bottom of the poster. No relation to each other. No relation to the poster. Just there. Basically, they were not using a 50% of potential of each poster, which is typography. This is the same one. So you can see this is a very clear example of how he tried to make a Persian type out of the existing Roman type. Uh, another one, this is a poster for festival, Persian festival actually, about Iranian art. And as you can see, the, there's no link between these two types. And even they don't have really active uh, role in the poster typography. Uh, these are some examples I'm going faster with. Examples from, uh, these are like uh, another example of just putting type in the top because you don't know what to do with it. So you are good, you are happy with your image, but typography, it's always there. Uh, again, another example for film festival, typography is just down there, trying to make the same thickness as the Roman type. Even, even this one, which is actually painted by very famous Iranian painter who is very good at Iranian uh, paintings. Uh, when it comes to typography, it goes very, very simple and nothing. So this is a history of typography before revolution. This is a very interesting example, actually. Look at, look at the Persian typography and look at the English one. It was much better in English one. And he did really creative things with the English title, but nothing with the with the English, with the Persian one. And this can be completely designed by a Swiss designer easily. You just replace, just remove the Persian one, and it's completely Swiss poster. Uh, poster for uh, art festival again in Iran. Same uh, for art festival. We had some exceptions, of course. There are there, there were some designs that were thinking about it. This is one of the very rare uh, examples of uh, using typography, not just as a secondary thing. Uh, it becomes a main image of the poster, but it's not a lot actually. I collect them all. They are like maximum fifty altogether. Uh, so I go faster. These are some examples. You can see the imitation from West here and there, especially in typography I'm talking. This is again a very good example of at least trying to imitate the atmosphere of uh, Persian page layouts in books, for example. But when it comes to typography, especially English part, it's not really well studied. So a few years back, when I started my teaching career at Tehran University, I tried to uh, rewrite the program and try to include uh, this problem in the program. Of course, for me also was not really known. I didn't know what to do. There were, there were no uh, information. I, I didn't know exactly what to do to solve this problem. But at least I tried to go in a way that it's, it's safe and it's not would harm students. So I asked them to study different source of uh, uh, writings in, in Persian um, uh, arts and cultures, different, different uh, parts. So like so I forced them a lot to, to, uh, to research architecture because I believe if you want to design something that has a different feeling, you need to change the structure, not necessarily surface. That's not going to work. 
So therefore, uh, architecture is very good source to understand how you build the building. And in the end, what you see, it has Persian feeling to it. And in the same time, of course, functionality, it's, it's very important. Mm, this is another example from interior design. So you can learn about colors, about the intimate atmosphere. You can learn about the combination of forms together, rhythm and colors, for example. Uh, so these are the materials I used to ask them to do visual uh, research on them. And then other arts in relation to architecture, such as tiling, for example. Uh, studying colors and forms and shapes, and of course ceramics. Uh, again, the combination of uh, these very simple forms and letter forms in the same time. Very interesting, different uh, handicrafts. Uh, I think I was thinking actually, if they can understand a little bit about the whole things together, it would make a kind of image for them to, to be in the, this atmosphere. Therefore, when you ask them to design something with the uh, Persian typography, they would, uh, they would refer to that. And it worked somehow. I will show you uh, some examples. These are just sources that we used to talk about. It. Uh, after that, actually, we start doing even more uh, tense uh, courses, separate as university, of course, I picked uh, 15 students and we spent like almost three years together to work on Arabic, uh, Persian typography and language and calligraphy together. So the, uh, our plan was to meet every week and sit and talk about the very specific details on whether calligraphy or typography and every uh, member of this group uh, would have a research about one of the subjects that would uh, make a big difference for us, for example. So we spent three years together, we, taught, we worked uh, in every session, different subjects, very, very uh, de into details. Of course, it would start with the uh, uh, general information about all writings. Uh, but then specifically about details on each of them. Then uh, <clears throat> we decided to, basically our uh, aim was to create information about typography which doesn't exist. So uh, after all of those sessions, we start publishing a, a, a book. We call it Dabire. Dabire is an, it's a name of the writing before uh, Arabic. So we call it Dabire, and this is the simple format for the magazine, and these are some of the pages. Even for the design of the magazine, we try to not really following the things that we learned for um, publication, which is really obvious. For example, having a big titles or having uh, not that close uh, columns next to each other, uh, or paragraph, the things that punctuation, for example, there's no punctuation in this text. And we tried hard to make it readable without using it, because again, this was one of our, our research, we find out punctuation is completely comes from outside. And now there's even in the poetry, sometimes you see punctuation, which is really funny to see a question mark in, in the end of the verses, for example. So we designed some of these details of this magazine. And uh, so we used the entire uh, publication, just one font, one size, just different colors. Uh, and then the format was in the right side, you, you have just information, the left side <coughs> is uh, illustrations. So these are articles about different stuff. For example, this is about the uh, beginning of Persian writings. Uh, or uh, there are articles like that, which is about structural Kufi, very detailed. 
different position, forms and shapes, studied well. Or even we try to design forms based on what we learned in this group, which was different as what we know how we should learn how to design type typeface. So basically what, what we did actually, we designed words instead of letters. And then in the end, we tried to separate them as each other. The result was very ugly individual letters, but combination was correct. So the result was, was correct. That's the opposite way we're doing it now. This is it. As you can see, the, the right side, it's the individual letters and the left side. It's, this is based on Kufi. Also, we had research, for example, on uh, anatomy of the letters, very detailed spacing, forms, shapes, combinations, connections. And mistakes sometimes you, you do for reading and re uh, reason for that. This is very interesting research on uh, evolution of one letter form throughout thousand years from the beginning till today, for example. This, in this case, we did this for many letters. In this case, it's year. And also some experimentation with uh, typography in 3D. And this is the magazine itself. And these are some promotional posters for the magazine when we launched the, launched the magazine. Uh, after that, uh, of course, all of the members, they went out of this group. They start working for themselves as a designer. And the following images I'm showing you is a result of work uh, of those, mem those members when they became graphic designer, independent graphic designer. So they have name, I'm not gonna repeat, but I'm just trying to tell you what are, what are they if there is no uh, information. So this is a poster for, it's a poster tribute to a Persian poet from uh, 12th century, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, poster for exhibition. So what is important in this part, I want you to compare it with the series I showed you in the beginning. So they were very good posters, of course, but you couldn't really say these are designed by Iranians or, or a specific location. But in, in those series, uh, they are, belongs to our time. I don't want to use the modern, the word modern, but at least it's clearly, it belongs to our time. And in the same time, it's clear these are Iranian or at least they come from this area. So this is a poster for uh, film screening. Uh, exhibition, graphic design exhibition poster. Concert. Exhibition again. So I tried to put them by like designers as much as possible. So you can see also the style, different style. So different approach. This is also a problem because uh, when you ask people to go and uh, look at the sources, usually the result it's similar most of the time. So but our aim was to use those information and translate it to the new visual language as much as possible. So each of them, they have a different style and they work differently. So this is a poster for a concert. Okay. Uh, exhibition. Uh, poster exhibition. Theater poster exhibition. Uh, poster for a conference, a graphic design festival, uh, this is a concert, poster for a concert, music, this is a promotional poster for the studio, uh, painting exhibition, Uh, painting exhibition again. 
Now, what is what is what is interesting for me now having a poster for the painting exhibition like that in Iran is very very understanding things. So no one have a problem with that. Uh, I, I think at least like 20 years ago was really question about like how this is a poster for a painting exhibition or still they can ask it. But it works, it works and, and still we're doing that. Uh, this is for the exhibition if I'm mistaken. Uh, Poster exhibition, silk screen poster exhibition. So even it really like this is very similar to the punk movement as a, as a, as an image, but what is changing it is typography, which comes from all of those backgrounds in a different way, and at the same time resembles the new uh, new wave in in graphic design. So. Mm, exhibition poster. Also for exhibition. A conference. This is inspired by a carpet. Uh, this is for a museum day. Mm, uh, cartoon exhibition. A film festival. Um, um, book week, mm, exhibition, painting exhibition. This is for a conference, a theater, um, this is for a lecture, uh, the book cover for music, a poster to tribute to Iranian writer. It's an exhibition poster for photographs. A book cover about music, Persian instrument. Book cover. Um, this is announcement for the courses, graphic design courses, typography courses. Uh, exhibition posters. So they, they asked me, actually, we are short of time. It's one hour. I had some more images, but I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. So can we have light? Sorry? No, um, I don't know. I mean, I can go from here. Actually, I put some of my work with uh, some um, references, that's it. I, if you want, I can go more, I don't know. But can you have light? There's no one here. <laughs> okay, so I go quickly, like, these are my personal, actually, research on, um, on how to use those sources for, for my own work. Of course, some of them are, are successful, some not, but so I'm going to show you, for example, in this case, the following works is based on Kufi, structural Kufi. We call it in Iran Banai, and Banai means building. So, <clears throat> so what is important, uh, thank you, is uh, simplicity, the complexity of design, which is amazingly important, colors and ideas, like the different ways they write something without thinking about it, this is legible or not and uh, how they combine together. Some of them are, as you know, and uh, you can read the negative and also in the same time you can read the positive part, which is very complex things to do. But anyway, these are samples. I'm, sh I'm sure you know some of them, like this is inside the Iranian mosques in Esfahan. This is another part of the same mosques, different techniques. So we know them all like, okay, these are stru structural Kufi, but they, they have a different range and techniques. So this is absolutely different as the one I showed you first. This is just based on same logic, but there's no letters. And so these are some, some of my work based on structural Kufi. So I really forced myself to do similar things that they used to do. 
And despite is if it's readable or not, if it's like um, really uh, working as a modern logo type or logo. So of course I had some compromises, of course, because you're working for a client all the time, but at least started with that. This is a logo type for the art festival in, in Holland. Uh, this is a logo type for a gallery in Iran. This is a poster for my own workshop in, in Esfahan. This is an identity for our architecture project. <clears throat> This is a logo type for a website about graphic design. A title for a movie, Italian movie, which was about um, uh, Islamic era. Uh, this is a poster for the same festival. So the whole text, whole, whole the background is a text uh, uh, about the festival. And this is my this is poster for my own exhibition in Italy. So I'm gonna go one more. <laughs> That's enough. So the next one actually, uh, it's next source of for me was painting and photographs. We have lots of photographs from uh, from uh, Roger period, which ended actually uh, 150 years ago, 100 years ago. And so I studied them all. They start with, we need to start with the paintings because uh, the composition and the imitation of the figures in the photographs, they all come from these paintings, you will see. Uh, these are the paintings from like 600 years ago, approximately, I'm not sure. It's similar. This is not really uh, usual things to have, have uh, uh, individual figures in, in miniature. So usually you have a scene actually happening, but this is different. They started by the end of the Safavid period. Uh, and then more recent, we have painting, which is you can see the influence of Western painting, but still the atmosphere is completely Persian. This is very interesting combination as well. So this means you can learn the technique, but still you can keep the atmosphere, you can keep the spirit. Uh, these are some examples. And then when it comes to this very interesting drawing from the same time, 150 years ago. And this is the one of the Iranian kings. Uh, so you see the figure in the photographs. They are really trying to imitate those paintings. And this to me is like part of our visual culture. We need to, we need to understand that. And this means this is part of our uh, common understanding about composition, form, shapes, and everything. So these are some photos from different people that, from that period. And then, so this was my uh, reaction about those composition. Many of you, you know my posters with, with the figure in, in, in middle. People, they would say, oh, it is really repetitive, I don't know what. Yes, I know, of course. I know they are similar to each other, but that was period that I was studying that. So these are the different posters for, this is a poster for a drawing exhibition. This is a poster for my own exhibition in Netherlands. Uh, even when there is no figure, I try to translate it to something else and keep the composition same. <clears throat> it's a book cover in Netherlands. Uh, book cover, novel, a poster for photography exhibition about uh, Afghans people in Iran, uh, magazine cover, uh, the poster for painting exhibition, uh, book week in Netherlands. Uh, this is a concert in Germany, music concert. Uh, my own exhibition about book design in Paris. Uh, 
and cover for book review in US. And this is a poster for uh, Hangul Day in Korea. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry, faster. <laughs> Come on, I can go back again. Okay. So, okay. What? Sorry? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, this is about bookmaking, of course, about how to make chart, how you make, how you arrange information, of course. Again, I spent time to really study all of those details and see how we can use it. This is the end of last page of the poetry book and uh, so these are some of the work i did this is a cover for first encyclopedia persian encyclopedia um so it's a cover spine and backside is a series of book cover for one writer persian writer so his name is repeating in, as, a, as a logo in top and then images changing in the bottom this is another series about Persian uh, history, literature, and science. Ah, okay. Then <clears throat> we go to Siamash. Actually, Siamash, we explain. I explain, but I'm just repeating quickly. It's just a um, kind of practice. Word by word, Siamash means black homework. So but you're doing it because usually actually it comes from really good masters. So basically there's no need for doing that, but they keep doing it because number one, they really want to understand the spirit of letter. letter. Number two, after a while it became kind of style for some of the writers. So they start writing this instead of writing very clean, just one sentence. So this this is like one of my major you know, like source of inspiration for many of my posters and designs. So of course in different way. I don't want to imitate. I'm not inviting anyone to revive all of those things, of course. But uh, we need to we need to base yourself ourselves on that. So this is a promotional poster for a magazine about cinema. But directly I got it from this piece, like. Uh, or this one is a poster, series of poster for uh, Iranian culture poster exhibition. So the big word, black word here means exhibition, poster, culture, Iranian. So we used to put them next to each other. Or oh, this is a divider for a magazine um, about literature, a film poster, so what is interesting about this may be like, it, this is a film that doesn't have dialogue at all. So that was my first idea to, to put a lot because that was, the, that was the aim, I think, from the director. She didn't want to, uh, to ask characters to talk to each other. Instead, she wanted to have lots of things, going, wanted to say lots of things going on without, without words. Uh, this is a logotype for calligraphy festival and co magazine cover and poster for a painting exhibition um, yeah sorry book cover this is a greeting card for new year This is a magazine cover in Netherlands on culture and art. Poster for concert, Persian music. These are dividers for a cinematic catalog. Book covers on Iranian history. Uh, it's a book cover about uh, Iranian poetry. <laughs> Come on. 
Okay. Okay. So the, the next one is ceramics. So yeah, okay, we're gonna end up this. <laughs> it's fine. Composition, of course, this is very, very interesting. Actually, I spent very good time uh, studying ceramics. And Iran is really famous for ceramics, especially Maybud, which is the middle of Iran, because of the earth, of course, and also the history of making ceramics and combination, most cases combination with the, with the writings, different kind of writings. So these are some examples from different time, of course. Um, and always I'm amazed by seeing the composition and forms and shapes, which is completely unique and yet absolutely you can uh, take it as a source of inspiration and do something out of it. So these are some examples, I go faster. I think you're familiar with it. And so, for example, this is some of, some of the work I did and print. This is a book cover. This is a ca catalog for uh, tourism. Poster for Iranian Studies Conference, Turkey. This is a magazine cover. And then I tried to implement it in different way. This is my exhibition, part of my exhibitions installation in Netherlands. So I, I designed a table with the typography based on the ceramics. And then I wasn't really convinced. I started making ceramics myself. So these are a series, series of ceramics actually. We didn't really make them. These are very limited edition, <coughs> but I did it. These are based on different concepts, mostly poetry, Persian poetry, some of them are translations, some just forms and shapes. Not this one is legible, but mostly not, such as this one. No, we really should stop. That's enough. Thank you.